Time once again for Community Forum, and we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, David Barsamian. David Barsamian is the award-winning founder and director of Alternative Radio, the independent weekly series based in Boulder, Colorado, and heard every Saturday morning here on KEXP. He is a radio producer, journalist, author, and lecturer. His interviews and articles have appeared regularly in The Progressive and Z Magazine. Friends of Community Media gave him the 2007 Media Education Award for outstanding work as a progressive media voice. The Institute for Alternative Journalism named him one of its top 10 media heroes. He is the winner of the ACLU's Upton Sinclair Award for Independent Journalism, the 2006 Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Award, and the Cultural Freedom Fellowship from the Lannan Foundation. He is also the author of numerous books, including What We Say Goes and Imperial Ambitions with Noam Chomsky, Speaking of Empire and Resistance with Tariq Ali, Original Zin with Howard Zinn, Ekbal Ahmad Confronting Empire, and The Decline and Fall of Public Broadcasting. And he is here to talk about his latest book, Targeting Iran, written with Noam Chomsky, Irvand Abrahamian and Nahid Mosafari. What was the motivation in uh, writing that book? The motivation was uh, primarily um, supplied by the corporate media, which um, does an extremely deleterious uh, service to the American people in misinforming them about Iran, about its culture, about its history, and about uh, U.S. relations uh, with Iran. Take, for example, the seminal event uh, defining uh, U.S. relations uh, with Iran, the 1953 coup uh, destroying democracy in that country, overthrowing Mohammad Mossadegh, uh, a very, very uh, critical and uh, crucial event. Uh, there's virtually no discussion of that or knowledge of it, its implications. Uh, if Americans know anything about Iran over a certain age, they'll raise their hand and say, hostage crisis? Well, there's a long and complicated history involving uh, the United States and Iran. Uh, Iran, as you know and listeners know, has a certain product that attracts uh, the United States. Um, based on my extensive uh, research, I've identified watermelons as that uh, product. Others disagree. They think, well, maybe it's cantaloupe or grapes. There's a fierce academic debate about what it is that Iran has that uh, makes it so attractive to uh, the United States. Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, since the end of World War II, uh, U.S. foreign policy is driven by oil. It is, it is an organizing principle of hegemony. It's the reason uh, that so many of our guns are there in the Middle East. It's the reason why uh, the water waves areas of that region have turned into virtual U.S. Great Lakes. We're sitting here in your studios, and I'm looking at a map of the United States with the five Great Lakes. Why not add the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean to the Great Lakes system of the United States? Then we'd have a better understanding about what the United States is doing uh, in the Middle East. Can you give us a little more history on uh, the election that brought Mossadegh into power? What was the situation prior to that? Uh, Iran had been uh, ruled by the Pahlavi monarchy. Uh, and in 1951, uh, Mossadegh uh, is pop popularly uh, elected by the Iranian Majlis, which is the parliament. Uh, he is a moderate, middle of the road, lowercase uh, Democrat. Uh, quite centrist, a great admirer uh, some of the United States. Someone has a lot of respect for American uh, traditions. Uh, he was uh, quite naive about uh, the United States. He felt that uh, America was different from the old empires that he was familiar with, the Tsarist and then the one that succeeded that, the Soviet, uh, the British, and the French. He thought that the United States would be uh, anti-colonial, that it would be pro-third uh, world and pro-independence uh, uh, in the third world. Well, little did he know that uh, that was not the case at all. Uh, the U.S. empire, particularly in the Middle East, inherits uh, the British Empire in a kind of handoff that's almost invisible. 
and the coup in 53 really marginalized Britain uh, in Iran and brings America into the stage as the uh, dominant player. Now, why did the United States overthrow uh, Mohammad Mossadegh and destroy democracy uh, in Iran. Uh, Mossadegh nationalized the Anglo-Iranian Oil Corporation. This is a predecessor to what is known today as BP, uh, British Petroleum, which incidentally constantly advertises itself as a green pro-environmental uh, company. I mean, that's quite uh, an imaginative, uh, I believe, uh, pl you know, marketing ploy. And 100% of the profits from uh, the Anglo-Iranian oil company were being repatriated to banks in New York and London. Nothing was going to benefit the Iranian people. Mossadegh is an, an Iranian nationalist. He's looking around his country. If you had gone to Iran in, say, 1947 and 48, uh, you would have found the bulk of the population, because at, at that time it was almost entirely rural. Uh, there was, you know, the capital Tehran, where there were a few palaces and, you know, some embassies and other, you know, uh, high-rise buildings. But if you had gone into the countryside, uh, you would have found a fifth-world country, people living in mud huts, no electricity, no, no running water, no schools, no roads, no services, no transportation. Incredibly uh, emiserated uh, population. So Mossadegh said, this is not right. This is not fair. Uh, these people should be benefiting from uh, Iran's oil wealth. So he nationalizes uh, oil. Uh, this sets uh, Britain and the United States in a tizzy. And uh, Churchill, who was the prime minister of England at the time, persuades Eisenhower that he has to do something about Iran. He has to do something about Mossadegh and re reverse this nationalization. And Eisenhower goes along with Churchill and launches a CIA campaign called Operation Ajax. It's led by Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of T.R., Theodore Roosevelt, who presided over his own burst of imperialism in the late 1890s and uh, early part of uh, the 1900s. And uh, Mossadegh is overthrown. Uh, the Shah is brought back from exile. He had been in uh, Rome, flown back to Tehran on a CIA plane. And the rest, as they say, is history. Iranian democracy is destroyed. Uh, the Shah rules in a tyrannical, dictatorial, autocratic fashion for the next 26 years, paving the way for the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Uh, there's little acknowledgement of this uh, from the United States in terms of its role in destroying democracy. The other important uh, thing to, to comment on about Iran, uh, it was the template for the coups to follow. This was the very first CIA operation where a government was overthrown. And it had all the classic characteristics of subsequent uh, operations. Mind you, the very next year in uh, Guatemala, another democracy was overthrown, that of Jacobo Arbenz. But Iran is the template, black propaganda first and foremost. That is, uh, the CIA is paying off, literally, reporters and editors to plant stories in the Iranian media that Mossadegh is a dupe of Moscow. He's going to f ban Islam, which is the religion of most Iranians, uh, that Russian will have to be spoken. People will not be able to speak in their native language of Farsi or the other Iranian uh, languages. So you had this portrayal of Mossadegh and the Iranian media that uh, Iran essentially was going to become a Soviet satellite. And this was, you know, really bad. Uh, then you had, uh, in another kind of classic operation, uh, payoffs to high-ranking military officers uh, in Iran to help foment the coup, to instigate rebellion. There are strikes. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, rumors and, and the um, spread of rumors. Uh, we saw this again in, in Chile in 1973 in the overthrow of another, yet another democratically elected government. I think this is something Americans need to understand, is that the real commitment to democracy of the United States outside the country. Because if you care to look at the history, you'll find that there's an enormous antipathy to 
uh, democracy. In fact, the, the other book that I just came out with, you mentioned targeting Iran, is uh, featuring Noam Chomsky, What We Say Goes. Uh, and this really uh, encapsulates uh, U.S. doctrine. What's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine, and what we say goes. As long as you behave, as long as you take orders from Washington and say, yes, sir, no, sir, you know, and lick my boots and kiss my hand and obey, like the godfather, you know, Marlon Brando, uh, you'll be well taken care of, well looked after, you know, you're, we'll send you a cheesecake on your birthday. Uh, we'll send you uh, flowers on your wedding anniversary. We'll send you need money for, you know, your college tuition. You know how expensive education is in this country. The Godfather's there with a check. But the moment you step out of line, it's lights out. You know, we're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. And that's really existing United States foreign policy, not the kind of garbage taught at universities and colleges about these fantasies and fairy tales of our dedication to liberty, democracy, freedom, and, and all of these things. Um, it's, it's important that, you know, we understand what's going on, because until and unless we do, there's no possibility to change it. As long as we're in this area of uh, fairy tales and myths, uh, then it will just perpetuate itself. And these are facts that the rest of the world uh, is very clear about and remembers very well, even though we here in the U.S. are, you know, having our uh, that history erased. The United States of amnesia, as Gore Vidal calls us, you know, we have a national Alzheimer's disease. Studs Terkel tells us, who's incidentally 95 years old and shows very few signs of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, take uh, another example that's, I mean, we just mentioned the 53 coup in Iran, which is known to every Iranian in great detail. And in fact, I noticed when I was lecturing, and I, I mentioned this in Targeting Iran, when I was lecturing in Syria and Lebanon, people in the audience that I was talking to knew more about the coup in Iran than I did, and I was researching and studying it. So it was a seminal event for the entire region, not just for uh, Iran. Take uh, uh, just another example, unknown here or forgotten down Orwell's memory hole. In July of 1988, the United States shoots down an Iranian Airbus over international airspace. Now, you know, history provides occasional uh, bookends to compare things. In 1983, uh, the Soviet Union shot down a Korean airliner. I don't know if you remember that. I know 1983, uh, you know, decades ago, we're really, you know, excavating deep history here. Uh, what was the response of Washington uh, to that? I mean, there was just an enormous outrage. Uh, Reagan uh, was pontificating at the time. This shows, this demonstrates the barbarism and cruelty of the regime in Moscow. Here you have Soviet communism. This is what it does. It blows innocent women and children out of the sky. Well, first of all, the Korean airliner, not to justify it, should not have been shot down in any circumstances, was flying in Soviet airspace in an area where there had been a lot of CIA penetration with uh, drones and U-2s and other surveillance aircraft. But leaving that aside, uh, it was a great propaganda moment for the United States to denounce the evil empire, uh, the Soviet Union. Now, what happens in July of 19? Uh, the United States Navy, uh, this is the only country in the world that sends flotillas and armadas to patrol other regions of the world, as I said, the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the Mediterranean, our virtual U.S. lakes, and has the temerity to call these routine naval exercises. What if the Navy of Iran, which barely exists, carried out routine exercises in Puget Sound. How would Seattle area residents feel about that? Would they be upset? Would they uh, throw flowers at the Iranian ships? Um, you know, it's interesting to uh, speculate. But we can get away with that because of the empire and the empire of lies that the media construct to justify the empire. So U.S. warships just happen to be uh, in the Persian Gulf, you know, on their routine naval patrols. And one of the ships, the Vincennes, sees uh, in its radar uh, an approaching, not near in any sense, uh, an Iranian Airbus, a civilian airliner, in international airspace. Now, there's a, a destroyer right next to the Vincennes, another 
U.S. ship on routine naval maneuvers, uh, and the captain notices the Vincennes is locking in with its uh, Aegis, it's an Aegis missile destroyer. It's locking in its missiles on the Iranian plane. And, you know, the, the captain of the other ship turns to his lieutenant and says, you know, is this some kind of exercise? You know, you know what's going on here? Why is he locking in on the uh, what is obviously a civilian aircraft? I mean, before there could be even an exchange, uh, the rockets take off. The plane is blown out of the sky. 290 uh, Iranians are killed. Uh, there is no apology uh, from Washington. Uh, then let's follow this up a little bit. So you must think, well, there must have been a court martial for this captain. Uh, surely he was demoted. Maybe he even served some jail time. Heaven forbid anyone who commits a war crime in U.S. uniform should actually serve uh, jail time. No, au contraire. He's given a medal upon his return to the United States. No compensation is offered to the victims of this major international uh, war crime. Crime. And in 1992, in an infamous statement, when actually someone from the press asked George H.W. Bush, who was then running for re-election as uh, president of the United States, that is the chief executive officer of corporate America, if we were again to call things by their rightful names, he was asked, well, what about this uh, Vincennes incident in uh, uh, 1980? I don't know where this reporter came from. You know, maybe it was someone had obviously slipped through the filter lines. Maybe it was Cy Hirsch or someone like that. And so they asked uh, George H.W. Bush, well, what about this civilian airliner that was blown out of the sky? You know, there's some evidence that it was in international airspace, that it was nowhere near the U.S. destroyer. Why, why was it shot down? Uh, do you know what Bush said? It's a memorable moment in American history. And here, here are the words of the Godfather directly. I don't care what the facts are. I will never apologize for the United States of America. Thank you very much, President Bush, for uh, your, your forthright uh, candor. Every Iranian I spoke to knows this whole liturgy and can recite it. You know, and, you know, they point to these kinds of things. States have memories outside the United States. Our memories are limited to Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears and Anna Nicole Smith and whether Michael Vick's career is over as quarterback of the Atlantic Falcons because he abused dogs. Uh, should he be allowed to play pro football again? Will the Red Sox uh, sweep the Colorado Rockies? I certainly hope not. I live in Colorado. Uh, you know, what about, what about the M's? Are they doomed never to make the playoffs? Should they have let Lou Pinella go after he won 160? games in 2001. What about those Seahawks? Are they going to finally get, are they going to bring a Super, Ho Super Bowl home to Seattle? You know, let's talk about weapons of mass distraction and not about reality. Outside the United States, there's a tremendous amount of information uh, what's about what's going on in the world. And inside the United States, there's a tremendous amount of disinformation and propaganda, brainwashing. Well, speaking of disinformation, uh, obviously a lot of the current focus on Iran is about potential nuclear weapons, and it brought out in your book, Targeting Iran, that uh, actually it was the U.S. that pushed very hard for Iran to become a uh, nuclear neighbor. This is a Shah. very interesting point, because again, since we live in the USA, United States of amnesia, there's no memory, the educational system doesn't educate, the media system doesn't inform, and people are left to their own devices. I mean, how do you find out uh, you know, how do you get information? You know, you have to get some dirt under your fingernails. You have to investigate. You have to, you know, find, you know, look at alternative sources. You have to go to Al Jazeera in English or Press TV in Iran or The Guardian or The Independent and some other, you know, sources, mostly outside uh, the United States to find out about uh, what had happened. It's a, it, again, it's, it's always good when you have these comparisons uh, to explain things. In 1974, the Shah of Iran, who was our boy in the Middle East, you know, our number one ally, buying billions of dollars of gold-plated U.S. weaponry, supplying oil at a very low price and in a steady flow to the United States, says to the Americans, announces that, you know what? Oil is a finite resource. 
And sooner or later, it's going to finish. Well, this is almost revelatory. I mean, in 1974, some, a leader of a Middle East country is making this announcement. I mean, no Americans were even talking about peak oil or that it's a finite resource. And you know what? Uh, Kissinger, who was Secretary of State, and Gerald Ford, who was the president, said, Mr. Shah, or whatever they called him, Madam Shah, Sir Shah, you know, Shah Sahib, Shah and Shah Shah, uh, you're right. You are a prescient leader. You are thinking about the future of your country and taking care of their energy needs into the 21st century. And we will enable that. We will sell you six GE reactors. And so Iran's uh, nuclear program develops with the full blessing of the United States. Now, when the Islamic Revolution uh, occurs in 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini, who becomes the supreme leader of Iran, says that the development of uh, nuclear power is un-Islamic. Very interesting kind of construction. I'd like to see someone call that unchristian or unJudaic or unHindu or unBuddhist. But anyway, he called it un-Islamic and closed down the reactors, shut down the program entirely. Now, in 2005, when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, everybody's demon du jour, vilified, you know, in, in the press, uh, the great New York dailies like uh, the New York Post, when um, Ahmadinejad came to New York and, on September 24th to speak at the UN, uh, the headline uh, was, the, the evil has landed. And then the Daily News, another great intellectual newspaper. These are comparable the, to the PI and the Seattle Times, by the way, in terms of, you know, right up there, the world's great newspapers. Why are you laughing, Mike? I don't understand. I mean, I'm trying to make serious commentary. The Daily News um, uh, headline was, the evil is here. You know, the evil has landed, or the madman is here. Sorry, the madman is here. The, the New York Post was, the evil has landed. So in 2005, Ahmadinejad is elected president of Iran, and he makes an announcement. You know what? Oil is a finite resource. Sooner or later, it's going to end. Now, did this sound familiar? Did, did, actually, were you listening about 120 seconds ago when the Shah makes the exact same statement in 1974 and is embraced by Washington? Wow, you're, you're a genius. You're, you know, you're looking into the future. You really care about your people. So when Ahmadinejad, who is not their favorite Shah, by the way, who's not called Mr. Shah or Shah and Shah or any of these things, he is um, denounced uh, and is saying Kissinger goes on the Charlie Rose show and says, this is preposterous. Are we, are we fools? Iran has all of this oil. Why does it need an alternative source of energy? Obviously, they must be building weapons of mass destruction. So you see, when there is no memory, you cannot do these kinds of historical para parallels and show the hypocrisy and duplicity in the power. Now we're in, you know, late 2007. The war drums are beating um, loudly. The aforementioned great Seattle paper, The Times yesterday, had a headline, Bush slaps sanctions on Iran. And, you know, every day, Cheney, Rice, you know, Bush, they're talking about World War III and Iran in the same sentence. Uh, the uh, bellicose and belligerent rhetoric uh, is being uh, heightened in order to prepare the American people and to justify a military strike uh, on Iran. Uh, the United States, which happens to be a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as is Iran, under which a uranium, any signatory state, has the right to enrich uranium for the peaceful purposes peaceful uses of atomic energy. The, uh, you'll never hear about this anywhere, National Public Radio, The New York Times, uh, any you know, highbrow uh, U.S. media source. The United States itself is in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I talk about that uh, in targeting Iran, because one of the conditions of the treaty is that those who possess weapons of mass destruction are obliged to pare down their arsenal, to reduce the number of weapons, to make the world a safer place. What has happened, actually, is a ratcheting up of weaponry. There are now new weapons being designed in Los Alamos in New Mexico and Sandia Labs also in New Mexico. New generations of uh, nuclear weapons, smarter, leaner, faster. Uh, the, the 
new war budget, another $200 billion down the Iraq, Iraq uh, Afghan sewage system, uh, yesterday also includes uh, $88 million to modify B-2 stealth bombers so they can carry 30,000-pound uh, bombs called Massive Ordnance Penetrators, or MOP you know, clearly intended uh, for Iran. Uh, we're in a very dangerous moment. Um, I know we're just a couple of minutes toward the end of our time here on KEXP, but uh, I think Americans uh, should be very aware of what's going on. Uh, not only do we need to get all the troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq, but we have to prevent a war against Iran. There are uh, demonstrations all over the country today, demonstrations right here uh, in Seattle. Uh, it's time to put a break on one of the most violent homicidal regimes in the history of the United States, a regime that, if unchecked, in my view, will launch a military attack on Iran, which will have enormous consequences. Driving in here, I'm sorry I had to drive, folks. I know you think I'm pure and I should be riding a bicycle or uh, walking, but um, a little bit far or out of town. Uh, I noticed, you know, gasoline is 310, 320. If there's a war with Iran, just think about that. You'll look back at 320 a gallon and say, wow, you remember those days when gas was so cheap? Because it will just explode. The price of gasoline will explode. The price of a, a barrel of oil will just dramatically escalate, and we'll be paying six, eight, nine, ten, twelve dollars a gallon for gasoline. And Iran is not a banana republic. All due respect to banana republics, it's not just going to take a strike from the U.S. on the chin and say, "Okay, have a nice day." They will fight back, and they have an ability to fight back. It's a country of 70 million people. The Shirin Abadi, who I talked to in the book, the Nobel Prize winner, win, winner uh, a lawyer, distinguished uh, jurist, human rights activist, brilliant woman. Uh, I talked to her in the book, and she says that any U.S. attack on Iran will boomerang because people will support the government in in Tehran, even if they are politically opposed to it, because Iranians are nationalists. They'll defend their country. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thanks very much.